Well, good afternoon. I'm going to make sure first, I'm not muted. Second thing, I am recording. And uh, welcome all of you. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. Let me uh, admit a couple more people. They're, they're coming in like in droves. Can't wait to see Kathy Durden. Uh, Kathy Durden is here. Before I uh, move to Kathy, I would like to thank Don Taylor. Uh, last week did a superb job. Uh, lot, got a lot of comments. Uh, thank you for that. How much you enjoy Don Taylor's uh, presentation and his questions. Really an all-around nice guy. Well, today we're in for a treat. And I mean a treat. Um, I met Kathy Durden at a uh, Florida Watercolor Society convention way back in uh, oh, six or seven years ago. Uh, she was sitting in a room doing, uh, participating in a workshop and uh, got to talking to her. And as a result, uh, got her to do a workshop at uh, uh, the uh, Lakeland Art Guild. I was the president at that time. And uh, we really enjoyed her workshop and have been an admirer ever since. And she has just been a, uh, a blessing in that uh, sharing with me uh, her ideas and not afraid to give me some ideas of how I can improve. So without too much going on, let's get her in here and, uh, and say hi, Kathy, and let's do a check and make sure we can hear you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear oh, me? that's good. Okay. That's good. Well, it's certainly nice to, uh, to meet, uh, have you meet all these people. We've got a real large group uh, today, I'm still admitting them like crazy. Of course, uh, I think Kathy's fan club might be all in here too. So, uh, <laughs> that would be a couple hundred people if we had them come in. Well, like it's Father's Day, and a lot of people, a lot of people have other things going on today too. Yeah. Well, Father's Day. Yeah. What a better! I uh, can you think of a better way to uh, enjoy Father's Day than to have a contact with Kathy Durden? Well, I'm sure your father probably has another idea, but there, there you go. <laughs> um, but it's being recorded, so there. So for all those people who couldn't, uh, who had Father's Day duties, they can watch it later. Yes, it'll be uh, online and ready for you. And Don's, uh, by the way, is available also on the YouTube channel. Uh, let's get started, Kathy. Just briefly tell us a little bit about your background and how in the world you got started watercolor painting. Oh, geez. I painted watercolor in high school. I, of course, grew up in Lakeland and went to Lakeland Senior High and took art classes the last year I was there and painted watercolor. My mother was an artist and she was a former president of the Lakeland Art Guild. So we have a lot in common. Wow. Uh, and I started exhibiting at the Lakeland Art Guild when I was nine. Oh, my. Um, the, oh, my is right. I'll tell you Offline, I'll tell you a story of, of a prize I won at the Lakeland Art Guild all those many years ago. Yeah, we'll anyway, save that for a special confab. Just a confab we'll save note. that for a special confab of, of history, <laughs> history and Central Florida art. Anyway, so I realized that uh, I also loved art history and realized I wasn't going to make any money doing that. So I got an accounting degree and did consulting for years and years and years and years and started painting again in the early 2000s, like 2003. Um, I took a couple watercolor classes when I was out of college at, uh, and, you know, community colleges, but, you know, really didn't paint because I was busy traveling and working and started painting again uh, and always liked watercolor. Uh, it's easy to clean up. It's very portable, it's not messy, um, and it's hard. And I always like things that are hard. So um, I gravitated to, to watercolor, I gravitated to painting people. Uh, I do like, I do paint a lot of people. I've taken a lot of workshops over the years. My favorites are Charles Reed and Ted Nuttall. I have three Charles Reeds in my stairway that I look at every day um, to remind myself to, while you think you're painting loose, 
loose does not mean, and loose can be fast, but it's very deliberate mm -hmm. and it's very thoughtful. And just because it's loose doesn't mean a lot of thought doesn't go into it. I'm thinking about where you're losing edges and where you're uh, saving edges and where what you're putting down where to um, connect and to draw the eye in for your composition. I also love color um, and I think my paintings are known for using a lot of color. Uh, I keep, unlike some people who only paint with a few colors, I have so many colors, it's amazing. And I, I can keep them straight, but my palettes are disasters. Um, <laughs> I don't mix in my palette. I let things mingle on the paper. So what I thought I'd do, because it also, because it's Juneteenth, and so Juneteenth causes us to think about diversity. I thought, well, let's talk to skin tones. So before I thought, okay, let's talk skin tones, I thought I'd bore every, I'm gonna bore everybody or bore my students with something I, I do a lot and talk about a lot as a foundation, and that is painting with three primaries. And there is a video on the FWS uh, YouTube channel on painting with three primaries. So I urge everybody, I'm gonna bring this, I just moved my studio to my office. So um, I'm not used, I've not broadcast in here. I actually haven't painted in here yet, but uh, I think you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. And when I say paint, understanding your three primaries, it's understanding, it's a fundamental of making, to make sure that you have clear paint paintings and not muddy paintings, but understanding what paint is in your pigment, what primaries are in your pigment. Because people get muddy paintings when they inadvertently bring in three primaries that they didn't think they were, or didn't think they were bringing in or didn't realize they were bringing in or whatever, but they inadvertently bring in three primaries. And what do I mean by that? Because we all, all here talking about warm and cool but I think warm and cool get, you start thinking of warm and blue, cool blues and people start going, getting their eyes crossed. So I think about the easier way to understanding is what other primaries are in your color and really understanding your pigments to know what primaries are in there. So what do I mean by that? So I've got, and I urge everybody to do this exercise because it's very eye-opening. Um, I have a yellow, two yellows, I have three reds, and you can do it with two reds, and two blues. And so I have bismuth, which is a pretty close to a true yellow, and it may actually tinge on the green side, and new gamboge. And I think you can see that new gamboge has a little bit of red in it, especially when you put it next to bismuth. And then wandering around our color wheel, I have Scarlet Lake, which you can see has orange in it, and Permanent Rose, and uh, Lizard and Crimson, which you can see have a little bit of blue in it. And it's very hard to find a true red that doesn't have either a little bit of orange or a little bit of blue. I mean, maybe Quinn Red or Pyro Red or something, but even when you start putting it back Next to each other, you'll see a tinge of orange, I think. And then over here, I've got cobalt blue, which you can see kind of tends a little bit this way towards the reds, and cerulean, which has some yellow in it. So then what I ask people to do is do swatches. Two of the bismuth, two of the new gamboge, um, two of Scarlet Lake and two of whatever other colors you're doing. And then put the other primary, the other adjacent colors next to it. So Bismuth and Scarlet Lake, Bismuth and, and Permanent Rose. And you'll see, and here we have Bismuth and Scarlet Lake and Bismuth and Permanent Rose. And you'll start to see it going a little brown when you've brought in the third primary, when you've 
done bismuth with a pinker red. And where you really see it is uh, when you put your new gamboge against a blue or red, and you'll start to see it go a little bit more on a kind of a brown or orange. And I think we see that over here. Where you really see this and where it really is eye opening is your greens. So here we have bismuth and new gamboge. And I put bismuth with the cerulean here and then with the cobalt. And I know about you, but there probably are times when you want to get that kind of green and that's new gamboge with cobalt blue. But you can see, and people don't realize how much you're, the impact of bringing in that sec, that third primary by bringing in the, uh, the red, you've got all three primaries happening there. Whereas here, you probably only have two primaries happening. So it's a much clearer green. Um, even here, it's a clearer green, but here it's just like, ugh. and you also see it in your purples. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so it boils down to uh, the number of primaries you're using and how you mix them. It boils down to knowing what is in your colors and knowing the primaries that are in your colors gotcha. and knowing and being intentional about what you're putting together. The other thing is I never mix on my palette. I only let it mix and mingle on, on my paper. When you mix and mingle on your palette, what you're doing, the beauty of watercolor is the light reflecting on the pigment, the particles of pigment. Well, and you can do this exercise. Mix, do a layer of a color, let it dry and do a layer of a color over it, just of another color. And then mix the two colors together in your palette. If you mix the two colors together in your palette, it will never be as bright and vibrant as if you do gla glazes on your paper. Mm. Because what you're doing is you're mushing together those pigments. And um, that's why they, it's people tell you don't over mix even when you're mixing on your pigment on your palette, because as you over mix, you're really mushing things together. Well, we definitely, me for one, uh, very easy to get muddy or mm -hmm. or uh, I, the people end up looking red. Uh, sometimes I like that, but. Uh, uh, well, it's sometimes you want this and sometimes you don't, but you sit there, you, you think you're gonna get a vibrant color and you get mud and you don't know why you got mud. Well, you've got mud yep. because you inadvertently brought in a third yep. primary that you didn't think through. Oh yes, yeah, Scarlet Lake has orange in it, or it has yellow in it. And I'm putting it with a blue that, um, I'm putting it with cobalt. Well, I put Scarlet Lake with cobalt, I'm bringing in yellow and I didn't mean to. Yeah. Uh, so reminder, really like remind everybody, if you have a question, you can ask it or put it in the uh, chat line. Uh, okay. So th this, uh, I mean, this is really interesting and I hadn't thought of it this way. Uh, and actually, it's simple. So it's trans simpler to understand than cool and warm, because yeah. people start talking, and then they're like, "Is ultramarine a warm or cool blue?" I no. don't know. You know, it's more like it's over here, and it doesn't have yellow in it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's easier to understand than is it warm or cool? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, uh, and so that's that's the way to think about things. So I thought when I went through some paintings, I, uh, so then I, I realized I use a lot of the same colors to create um, my skin tones. So I did some skin tone. This is a bunch of skin tone um, pink colors. And this is for people who have fair skin. 
And I'm using, and I'll go through and you'll see, and, and we can share the PowerPoint. I went through a number of my paintings and went through the colors that I put together. But you can see here, I'm putting together a lot of different colors in a skin tone. I use a lot of Janet's Rose over here. I use, um, I generally start with raw sienna or um, yellow. I've started, thank you, Nina. I have started employing yellow ochre light. I tend to use a lot of the canacridones, and I also tend to use, um, I just basically work my way through the canacridones. When I'm working with fierce skin people, I tend to use a lot of pinks. Um, I'm generally not using opera, I'm generally using um, some other colors, and I will use um, like a scarlet, uh, Quinbert scarlet. Another color I really love, which is very useful for very fair skinned people, and you'll see it in a bit, is Rose Dore, which is a, um, it tends to be a very fine, it, it's hard to uh, see that pigment because it tends to blur away very much easily. But for like old older people with very, fragile looking skin and babies. It's really a great color. So then we'll go to dark complected people. And again, I'm using, um, I'm bringing in probably more of the uh, canacridomes. I'll start, um, I'll still start perhaps with a raw sienna, but I'm going to use a Quinn gold. I'm going to use Aussie red gold. I'm going to put a lot more purples in. Uh, I'll use uh, Rose of Ultramarine. I'll use Quinn Violet. Uh, I will also on both all of these, including these, there's um, Quinn, Quinn Lilac. I really like Quinn Lilac. And uh, Mineral Violet. And up here, I brought in some cobalt blue violet. So um, what I thought I'd do is go through some paintings and show you the reference photo, the painting, and then just talk through some of the colors I used. And um, this is one where you might want to take a little bit of notes, but um, Ron will make the PowerPoint available and it's all in the PowerPoint. So I'll share my screen. There we go. Okay. So let me get there. So we've already talked about that. There's my typical pigments. I use a lot of canacridomes um, and just work my way through. And I can throw in, and you'll see, I throw in things like uh, transparent uh, orange and things like that too. So here's, here's an image and here's the painting. And this was a this painting actually was a very quick painting that I did as a uh, as a as a quick study demo that uh, it was supposed to be a, a study for the painting and then I ended up using it using the painting and the painting ended up getting in in shows around the country which was pretty cool but it is just raw sienna the canacridomes quin gold quin burnt orange quin burnt scarlet there's some quin coral in her mouth and around her nose. Uh, lilac and violet, and then the hair is in and thrown raw sienna, raw umber and burn umber, and uh, quin violet up in the hair too. So, and then there's just ultramarine. So I was keeping this on a very simple uh, color uh, palette. Here's another one um, where, and what I typically do when I start with a pick with a photo is I'll lighten it so I can see what's going on, which I did in this instance too. Um, and again, canacridomes, there's bright violet, see the bright violet under her nose and in her mouth, cobalt blue violet, particularly in the hair, mineral violet, and then the eyes. I always use a combination of ultramarine, in the throne, uh, probably uh, cobalt blue violet, Winbert scarlet for the muscle of the eye. And I, 
typically is understeer green in the eye, regardless of whether their person's got green eyes or not. I just think it makes it more interesting. Uh, here's another painting. This is the painting that actually won first place in, in Georgia years and years and years ago. Um, thank you, Frank Webb. Um, got, I, you know, I wouldn't have given it first place, but there you go. Um, and Kathy, you when, see, you, uh, when you paint, uh, where do you start? Where do I start on, yeah. on what I do? I will do a layer to find the dark, to kill the whites. And I will work my way around that painting, uh, killing all the whites. And then I'll do a layer to build up shadow shapes. And then I'll go to the eyes. Okay, cool. Because if I don't get the eyes right first, I might as well scrap the painting. Now you painting in, uh, someone asked, um, looks like you're painting in wet. How do you control the wetness of the paper? Most of these I paint on 300 hot arches and that tends to not be, it, it's pretty absorbent, but if you're, um, if it gets too wet, you stop and go somewhere else and wait for it to, dry down a little bit. And it gets to a point where you're just throwing color in and it's going away. And then it's just like, okay, I gotta stop. And that was the case I'll, in a painting I'll sh show you in a minute where I just had to stop because I was throwing so much color in. Um, and a lot of times some of these are demos where I'm painting fast. So I just have to keep going. Um, and you can see on this one, I put in a lot of violets, um, lilacs, for, uh, um, mineral violet, cobalt blue violet, um, lots of bright colors, a lot of quin gold in her face, uh, and then the hair. That red up there on uh, her forehead on our top left and on the left, what, that's pretty bold, but it really works. What is that? Is that the rose? That is probably lilac. Hey. And I'll tell you, I have one story I tell my class all the time, and I have this painting on my, on my stairway. I was at a session with uh, a class with Charles Reed, and he was painting an African-American girl and who he, had, he worked off of live models in his demos. And you, he put a big blob of azure and crimson on her cheek. And he, he told us we were all gonna freak out and we all freaked out and there was gaps in the room. And he said, no, I'm gonna show you how I resolve that and how it doesn't, it, it blended in. And I think the other secret to, to, to painting is you have to keep moving your painting for all areas of your, your painting forward at the same time. If you're painting it at night and try and get everything to a level of perfection, you know, let's get the eyes done and everything, versus bringing the whole thing forward at the same time, you realize that, it, or you start to think, well, you know, that big blob is scary, but when you get it in context and you keep building it up, it stops being as scary. Yeah. Well, somebody asked, uh, Kathy, uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, kill the whites. What do you mean by kill the whites? Uh, I try and cover the entire surface with a some color at some point before I, before I move forward so that I, I don't have a lot of white surface and then I just keep layering on on top of that. Okay. Uh, so that, um, you know, the first thing you do is you, you start with basically creating almost a toned surface. So, and then you just keep building and building and building. Yeah. So here's an example of someone with very, very dark skin. 
Um, and you can see there's a lot, of, and there was a lot of dark skin in the individual's face to begin with, and a lot of purples in that face to begin with. So again, same, same set of colors. There's, there's some moon glow, there's some, I'm gonna talk a, minute, late, a little bit later on um, beards, uh, because beards can be scary, but here I, I think there's cascade green in that beard, um, you know, and it works because it's, um, and you can see how much violet there is, um, quin violet and bright violet in, and uh, lilac in the hair too. I love those colors, wow. Here's another very dark complected person and I used a lot of cobalt blue violet in there. It's cobalt blue violet, that's predominantly mineral violet, cobalt blue violet, probably quin violet and, and um, quin burnt orange and quin burnt scarlet. And that's pretty much, and then I used it, I don't, put out the diazazine until I'm very ready to do it. And this was one where you ended up having to put some diazazine in there. Mm. And, but you, once you put diazazine in, you can't go back. So you just, you wait to the end to do that. Now this is one, this is one we did as a class a couple of weeks ago when I said, oh, we're gonna do skin tones. So let's practice some skin tones. So this was a picture that uh, Fran Hudek took in Roatan of a girl. And uh, I actually have her much more yellow than she is. I should have gone a little bit more orange in her face, but uh, you can see there's a lot of Janet's Rose in there. There's a lot of uh, Quin, the Quinacridones, there's um, Rose of Ultramarine, and then the hair has some cerulean in it. Uh, deep schminky, deep blue, moon glow, burn umber, and sepia. And uh, quick, here's uh, a painting. A quick question or comment. Yeah, no. Uh, I, uh, the comment is, I like that you don't take the dark values as dark as they appear in the photos. Uh, shadows, uh, are, shadows are a par problem area for me because I try to match the value. Yeah, and I won't, I won't take it that dark because I'm, you know, I'm looking at the whole painting. I'm not looking as much with the photo, I'm looking at the painting. Yeah. And, um, but what I also do is I do Photoshop the, the image lighter so that I'm, wor I'm generally working with a lighter image than what is in the photo. <laughs> So what you uh, when you put in, you just, uh, select the bright, bright, uh, the brightness or the contrast or just the, uh, I guess which which lever you're pushing. I do I do um, make brighter. Okay. I don't do the contrast. I do make brighter. Gotcha. And I just simply do a make brighter. Just and also because a lot of times you can't see what's happening in the shadows, and. Right you want to be able to see what's happening in the details in the shadows to figure out what you're going to do. Um, so here's one, again, I made her a lot, I did pull up the, the brighter version of the image, I pulled up that version. Um, this was a fun painting. Um, it's still at the Tampa airport um, exhibit of Florida watercolor paintings. There's an awful lot of color in her face. There's a lot of bright violet. You can see it in her underneath her chin. There's bright violet in her lips. There's quin coral in her in her um, in her cheek. Um, I had this photo for probably ten years before I decided to tackle it um, because the it's all about the the um, the straw hat reflecting on her face. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's amazing about these colors is the uh, taking advantage of, of course, transparent paint, but the glow, the way it, um, yeah, it's hard to explain 
it has a glow to it. The colors don't, aren't just sitting there. They look like they're really uh, glowing. I'm I'm not afraid to go to put color in and not a wimp about putting color on. But I'm also thinking about is this color going to, what's it going to do with the color next to it? And you're going to get the vibrant clear colors when you don't bring in the third primary inadvertently. Yes. yes. So it go, it's always goes back to you get clear color, you will start to get money and you will, uh, your colors won't glow when you inadvertently bring in a third primary. It's also not being afraid. So look at her chin. Her chin has um, transparent orange in it and the transparent orange is what's popping out at you. Yes. How many layers are right there on that orange? So this is my nephew. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of layers there. Yeah. There's a lot of layers on there. And I, and I will go back and put the, put a color over it again if it seems to go away. Because watercolor, we all know it dries lighter. And then you're like, oh, where'd it go? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm to go get it back again. So this is my nephew. And I... Uh, I was having dinner with him and noticed the light. And so I got him to actually do a photo shoot for me. Um, so I could get good color. And there's, um, there's a lot of Janet's Rose in there in that, and Rose of Ultramarine in that phase. Um, and some Rose Dor uh, and some Rose Dory and some Rose Matter. So it's, uh, even though he's Korean, it's, there's a lot of, pink in that face. Now this is the painting we did in class last week. And there are so many layers and her cheek, it got wet and I, I definitely had to stop and let it dry because it, it, but there's, um, it started with, Yellow, uh, yellow ochre, then there's some regular orange in there. There's some transparent orange in there. There's some Quinn Coral in there. There's Janet's Rose in there. There's Quinn Burnt Scarlet, Burnt, Quinn Burnt Orange in her cheek. Um, it kept, we kept layering and it did get to a point where I had to stop and let it dry a little. Mm. Um, there's Rose of Marine in her neck, um, but it glows because the other thing you do is when you put color down, you don't, um, you do it softly so you don't uh, disturb the layer underneath. So you don't, don't scrub and you don't mush the, it's just like you don't mush the pigments together on your palette. You don't mush the pigments together on your, on your paper as well. Mm -hmm. You just put them down and let them, let them bleed around and see what they do. Yeah, I like the Sometimes fact that they you do good things. Yeah. I like the fact that you didn't try to uh, copy uh, the hat with all those distracting uh, forms up there. Some would probably try to put that in there. It would have been, it, it was all about her, it was all about her face and yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, there's Aussie red gold in there. I, there, I probably put, I put, I even tried vermilion. I don't usually use vermilion and somebody said, oh, I have, I don't have scarlet lady. I have vermilion. I said, okay, let's try some vermilion in here. I mean, I threw everything in the kitchen sink at this one. And now she's fun. Uh, her hair actually does have bright violet and manganese in it and moon glow. I mean, her, her actual hair. So, um, but there's a lot of, to keep her bright, there's a lot of orange in there. There's a lot of bright violet. Um, and there's a lot of, um, yeah, it's just a very vibrant painting and keeping it that's keeping the palette relatively limited so that the, all those colors just really blow, glow out at you. 
Did you use uh, masking fluid to keep the uh, white strands or, or wax or something? Oh yeah, yeah. There's definitely masking fluid on this guy, on this one. And it's all about it. And and the other thing is teeth are not white. <clears throat> People think teeth are white. Teeth are not white. There's raw sienna in there, and there's some uh, uh, moon glow in there. Um, and you knock them back. So teeth teeth are not white. Don't make your teeth white. And definitely in the edges, don't make your teeth white. Now I said I was going to talk about beards for a minute. Um, understand. Oh, my. oh, that's cool. Okay, this is this was taken at a reenactment of the Battle of Bow Lake Creek, south of Fort Meade. Um, yeah, it was great. It was one of those. I I painted this guy twice, and both were one got into FWS, and this one got into Adirondack. So they were they were great. I knew a good subject when I had one, um, but no. I use a lot of cerulean and raw sienna in beards or raw umber. Know what your cerulean and your raw umber do together. Know if they're going to make green or gray. Um, I actually use three different raw umbers in my palette. I use mineral uh, Holbein, Windsor Newton, and Daniel Smith. They're all very different. They do different things. They react differently to different um, to cerulean. I that I hate to tell you how many ceruleans I have. Um, some are more blue. Some are more are are more green. Some are more vibrant. Some are more opaque. So pick the one that's going to have. If you're going to do something like a beard, um, pick the one that's going to react and not turn into a color you don't want it to be. Someone asked a question. Um, do you get authorization, written authorization from the, uh, or authorization from your models to paint them? Usually not, but usually I'm either, like in this, persons at, people at reenactment, you, you say, can I take your picture? And they say, yes, like you can take, you know, they're there to have their picture taken. Yes. Um, if I'm, I'm shooting into crowds a lot. And so I'm just shooting into crowds and then cropping in. Um, let's see, let me just look at some of these. I like this woman knew I would, she knew we were shooting pictures for, uh, to, to paint her. Um, this one is one of my students painting images that was my new that was shot in a crowd that was shot in a crowd this was a homeless guy walking down the street and i shot it from across the bridge this was a model so you know that was an artist who i who knew i was shooting her and that was shot in a crowd And I know there are people who say that you, if you don't get authorization, they can come back at you, but they can only come back at you to the extent you make money off the painting. And, okay, another reenactment. So again, um, these are people walking around wanting you to take their picture. So you can see the amount of raw sienna, the bright violet, the bright lilac in his face, and the oranges. And there's a lot of orange in the shadows too, which make him very vibrant. This was at that same Fort Meade reenactment. I had that for years because she was wearing a black dress and I didn't know what to do with it until I decided to go very colorful on her. And there is so much bright violet and lilac in her nose and in her face and there's opera in there and oranges and um, 
and then moon glow in her hair, moon glow and raw umber in her hair. Uh, this was a violinist in, in Italy and uh, I did pay him. Uh, I think if you're, if somebody's busking and you're taking their picture, you better give them some money. And you can see the greens in his face and the cerulean that I put in there. And there's a lot of opera. Um, and, you know, sap green, rose of ultramarine, um, burnt orange, etc. Now, this is my niece. Um, very fair skin. But I put this in because of the amount of green I put in her hair. I thought that was fun. Um, and I used Rose Dory in her face because it's she's very fair. Um, there's a lot of different orange gold colors in her hair. Um, another color to know, and, and if you paint people who have dirty dishwater and blonde hair, there's a Holbein has a color called yellow gray, which is it's very opaque, but it is the color of dirty dishwater hair. So, which is very useful for children, babies, etc. And then this is a quickie I did for one of my students who brought her grandson's picture in. And I don't happen to have the photo of it because I just did a quick drawing from her photo, but I wanted to show the roses and the, the delicacy of, of small children and what you can get out of uh, just being very light handed in what you're doing. And I, I painted this in you know, 10, 15 minutes. Well, those are uh, um, and very, very inspired on my side. Um, here's an here's another one I didn't I didn't realize I forgot about this one. This is one of this is a fave of mine. Hmm. And see all the cerulean and blue. I don't generally put blue in people's faces until the very end because if you put I think if you put blue in too early, it looks like they've been in the refrigerator. Um, you have to watch your pinks too to make sure they don't look like they've been in the refrigerator for too long. Um, and but here there's Quinn magenta, uh, Quinn violet, and then there's uh, cerulean reflected up into her face, and then this is Prussian coming down too. Can you uh, bring that a little bit closer to the camera? Uh, sure. that's, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. The sunglasses. Okay, that's what's up there. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. I painted this a bunch of times because it's a fun image. Yeah. yeah um, light, her hair, light, is it, she's okay. got great hair. She's got great shadow shapes on her face, etc. Go out with your camera when on a sunny day in an art show, you'll get a gazillion good pictures. That's quite nice. I just love that. Are there any questions for anyone? Yeah, I'm to bring this one closer and you can, you can see this okay. too. Oh. Now, did you, uh, someone asked on this one, Kathy, did you use any... Uh, um, any relief or any? Uh, I use no masking. I use no masking fluid okay. on this one. Okay. And I'm really proud of that earring. I How thought that? that was the first time I've managed to do an earring that didn't look terrible. And I use no masking fluid. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's what someone asked about that. No, no masking fluid. And I was like, okay, we're just gonna wing it and we're gonna try and make sure that we preserve the whites as we go. And <laughs> it's a good exercise to try and do. Now, we were earlier before Ron and I were talking, um, I painted 
Oh, I was hoping you would share this. Oh, I was, uh, I painted, the, this had masking fluid. I did, I used the PBO marker, masking marker to get the whiskers in the area around her nose and here and here and up in her eyes. Cause I can't get that kind of, I can't um, paint around that nor do I want to, cause I want to have all these colors waving in with each other. Oh, that's, how do you uh, choose your format? Uh, be, square, rectangle, or, and the size of paper you use? Uh, I like to paint half sheets just because they're easier to do than full sheets. Um, but some subjects you have to do have she full sheets. Um, I tend to paint a human face I, I know a lot of portrait, you know, pure portrait painters say don't paint the, the face any bigger than it actually is. I always paint the face bigger than it actually is. Well, this one's short. This is a quarter sheet. But generally, I'm painting bigger than it actually is. Uh, frequently because I'm doing a demo and to be able to see it. Also, I can't paint small faces. People come into my class and they're trying to paint a face that's like less than three inches across. And I'm like, there's no way you can get the detail in. You'll just be fighting it. There's no way in God's green earth you're going to be happy with that. If you're going to paint a small face, then you're painting that face almost like calligraphy as an impression of a face. You've got to get it big enough that you can actually get into the details of the eyes, et cetera. Otherwise it's just not gonna be, you're just not gonna be happy. Uh, um, and then I'm looking at composition too. That's awesome. Hey, um, tell me, you, uh, you teach, you, uh, if anybody was interested, can they come and sure. join or do you have a demo or any workshops coming up? Sure, I don't have any workshops coming up, but I do teach every Tuesday, uh, one to three. And I am both live and on Zoom at the same time. So uh, we've been, we try and be both at the same time. We uh, have a pretty good group of people who, even if they're together on Zoom, they're interacting. Um, so I, you don't have to be in Tampa to come on in. Um, just join us when, you know, just text me and I will, uh, add you to the group and I record all my sessions. So for people who can't make the session, they can see the demo and see what everybody else is doing. Excellent. And what, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, uh, email or, uh, email or text. I'll do both. Okay. I'll do both. And I'm, I'm really easy. I'm, Kathy Durden at gmail.com. My website may or may not, uh, it's not necessarily the most up-to-date thing in the world, but it does have the class on it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am, I believe I am going to be doing a class at next year's FWS convention. I believe Jackie has, um, put me down for a workshop. I think I'm going to be doing a two day. Okay. And I think it's half of it is going to be on composition. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, and, we uh, do a, I do a composition workshop where we bring, everybody brings in failed paintings and we try and work through how to fix them. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, if any of you would like for us to have maybe a uh, confab one day workshop by Zoom, uh, let me know. Just send me a little note here on the chat if any of you are interested in one day. Maybe we could arrange a, a half day or a full day workshop with you just to see you paint and uh, we paint along with you. You feel free if anybody wants to. I'm I'm I do it at the art center. I used to do it at the house, and I'll be. Now that I've figured out how, where everything is here in the new studio that I moved a week ago, um, we'll, uh, we can do it here too. 
Excellent. Any, uh, any, any other questions? Hopefully this was instructive and, and people that, so the idea is don't be afraid of color, but know your colors. Yeah. Would you mind uh, bringing up uh, uh, Lena again, the, the puppy? Lena, let's see uh, Lena. Lena. Okay, yeah. there's Lena. Okay, I just had a couple of questions on it. So um, a little bit about uh, the strategy around uh, how many different colors of blue are in there? It looks like there's a couple. Oh my gosh, there! I I was using my entire palette, and anybody who knows me knows I have a huge palette. So I have cobalt and manganese, and Antwerp and marine and Prussian and iridescent electric blue and um, Kingsman turquoise up in here. And there's pure yellow. So this is bismuth yellow or Hansel light down in here. Lovely. These are about three different colors of orange in there. There's a couple of colors of raw umber in her, in her face plus a little bit of raw sienna and a little bit of Aussie red gold. And then a lot of cobalt blue violet. Mm -hmm. And I was probably using Schminky cobalt blue violet because it's a little bit brighter than anything else. I might've been using Schminky cerulean in this. Um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of colors in here. This was fun. Uh, yeah, this they, was, this the was green. The, uh, you weren't afraid to use a little green in there. I've seen a lot of uh, dog pictures in water, but I've never seen any that pulled it off that's loose like that. And that really works. Uh, usually they're uh, painted like a photograph because the fear of you know not getting the water right. Well, and I did use some um, white wash in here. Mm -hmm. um, usually I try and stay away from gouache, but on this one, I knew that you can't, you know, you can either do the splashes and do a lot of, lot of um, masking and try and do splashes that look very photorealistic, or you can just do white gouache and just kind of um, lose the edge, which is what this is here, mm -hmm. in here where you just make it milky and, and lose the edge. And uh, that's what I did here. And there was a lot of masking in here too, but, um, and a lot also of just, I'm gonna keep this white or keep it light. Mm -hmm. And I see a couple of, uh, I think a couple of blossoms there, which, did you plan those blossoms? Because it looked no, like- No, but they look good. You, I mean, you're lot, you're just I was lucky. working, this is, um, I think this is only on 140. Uh, yeah, this is 140 cold, I think. This is not 300. So this got pretty wet. This was a, this was a fun, I got my Florida painting done and I'm not sure I like my Florida painting, but I want to do something fun. So I did this. Yeah, that, I can tell it was fun. You're, it shows you you have more fun and you, you're more successful when you take the pressure off. Yeah. That's why you produce so many in your demo classes because you're just up there. If any, I've been to a, a class of a workshop with Kathy and, uh, and she's pretty much, she talks through the whole time. And just like this, it's, uh, she talks about the color, she's applying it and uh, really encourage you to, uh, really tune in to a, a demo or any workshops Kathy does. You'll be glad you did. And uh, we, ought to, we ought to do a workshop or at least a demo sometime for the confab people. And uh, uh, so any more questions? These were good questions. And um, there'll be a, a candy bar for the person who asked the best candy, I mean, asked the best question. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me. Uh, well, I think someone has. Lena and I are going to go in the pool after this. Oh, you got it. It's not raining there. Yeah. 
Nope, has it started raining? And it says no, it's not going to start raining till after six. So, I think I think she deserves an, a pool. Yeah. Session. <laughs> well, let me uh, tell everybody. I'll uh, highlight myself here, and uh, I want to tell everyone about what's coming up. And uh, I'm going to uh, place a spotlight, and there we go. And I'm going to. Share the screen. There we go. Uh, so let me go back up one. I think uh, I missed. Uh, there we go. Let's go. Let's start with the top. Okay. Next week is um, Susan Hansen. Uh, she's a remarkable painter. Uh, unique style. Uh, she does not paint realistic. She paints. Truly, uh, uh, from her feelings, her heart, and uh, very creative. And uh, you will really enjoy how she goes about uh, painting. And then following uh, her the next week uh, is July 4th. We're going to take a, a 4th of July break. A lot of fireworks, I'm sure. Uh, Cole Wolford's coming on July 10th. He's going to share um, kind of the... Uh, it what is a unique uh, use of uh, uh, the autonomizer. If you've not ever used one, uh, by the way, do not breathe in using one. Just to, just so you know, uh, he's going to show us some of the works he's done with that, and there's been a lot of a uh, lot of shows very successful. And Elise Beatty is a wonderful lady. Just uh, you'll just get the biggest kick out of her her approach to life. And the way she thinks about painting, and uh, she just loves to have fun. And it, it, you see her and talk to her, she's uh, uh, a lot of fun. She's very uh, well uh, known, particularly in the Northwest part of the world of this country. Has a lot of workshops and does a lot of uh, uh, classes. And then uh, Lynn Mesford is uh, going to join us. And she's going to, uh, one of the things that uh, she's going to share, I hope, will be a couple of the landscapes, very unique, and the use of uh, re uh, repetitiveness. Uh, it's just beautiful, great composition uh, techniques that she has. She'll be sharing on the 24th. And then uh, we've got uh, Donna Morrison. All of you have heard of Donna Morrison. You will love her. If you have not had a chance to see her and talk to her, this is the chance. And uh, she does just a beautiful job, uh, what's called, I, what she calls visual storytelling. And she's gonna talk about how she goes about telling the story with her painting. Uh, then we have Randy Globus, uh, you know, Google her, you'll get a big kick out of what she does. She uh, creates dolls and looks like puppets and things and she sets them up and then she paints them. Very unique. <laughs> You'll just get the biggest kick out of her. So those, uh, you see the ones there on her painting. Those were actually something she made, and then she painted them. And uh, uh, she'll talk a little bit about some of her transformation and some of what she calls is is the self is is really uh, come out and coming at art and really bringing yourself what you have inside to your art. And then uh, uh, Vlad, um, I think a number of you have gone to his workshops and he's going to be here sharing. Um, and I talked to him a couple of times about the topic and uh, suggested, he said, no, I want to talk about one thing. I want to talk about being loose. And he said, my approach, I just really want to share that. So he's going to share and talk about his approach to being loose. And uh, then we have uh, Bev. Yankwit, uh, Yank she is the president of the Florida Watercolor Society. We're going to at that time to really talk about what we can expect at the uh, convention this year. And uh, I hope all of you have all signed up by now. Uh, it's a great place to meet people. If you're all in a, ever get in a, a painter's funk, you know, um, I found out the first convention I went to, it so inspired me in every convention I've gone to just inspires you to do more and being around a bunch of people like yourself that like watercolor painting. So she's gonna 
talk a little bit about that. And uh, that's the confab for today. I want to thank again, Kathy, uh, you were quite amazing as usual. Uh, I just think the world of you and appreciate how you are willing to help so many people. And uh, again, thank you very much. You're entirely welcome, and thank you for having me. And this was fun because it forced me to actually think through some things uh, that I hadn't thought through. And now I think I've got to write a blog on uh, doing skin tones. Yes. Well, uh, I've already decided. As soon as we hang up here, I'm going to work on a painting, and I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to try a little more color. So you really inspired me, and I'll bet there's others the same way. So see you next week. Um, Susan Hansen will be here. Don't forget, sign up. Sign up for the convention. And uh, there's three awesome, well, actually four awesome workshops coming up. So uh, if you haven't done it, get with it. Okay. Bye-bye.